So in the first lecture this week, I presented the problem of trying to find a maximum flow across a network carrying fluid, say, from a source to a sink. And I showed a method for doing that in which we started with some flow, which could have been zero, and we keep increasing it in steps until we can't get any more flow from source to sink. And I'll be talking more about that method in the third video. It's, it corresponds to what's called the labeling algorithm. Uh, but today I want to talk about a different tool which can be used to measure the value of a flow and in particular estimate the value of a maximum flow. And this tool is called a cut. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It amounts to cutting the network into two halves like these two dotted cuts here, one is green and one is red. Both of those are cuts of this network, which is the same network we had last time, if I've remembered the capacitors correctly. Now, in what I'm talking about at the moment, we don't worry about any flows. We don't, I'm just showing you the, the, the network, the underlying network of pipes and capacitors. There's no flow at the moment on this network, or if there is, I'm suppressing it. The discussion of cuts and their capacities uh, can be entirely carried out by looking at the network without reference to a particular flow. So if we want to say it mathematically, we would say that a cut is a partition in which the set of vertices splits as a disjoint union of two non-empty subsets, capital S and capital T, that's this statement here, uh, and capital S has, has to contain the source, and capital T has to contain the sink. And as I say, they're disjoint. So if we look at the green cut to start with, you can see that the, that splits the network into two subsets, or splits the vertices, I should say, or the nodes. Sometimes one calls the vertices of the network the nodes splits it into two subspaces. The first one, which has to contain the source, is the source, S, together with A and C. And the second subset, I don't have to write it down because it's just the complement, the, the remaining vertices, which in this case is just B and T. Okay, so that's the first cut, the green cut. And when you have a cut, you can, if you like, you can throw out, or it, it it lets you focus on the edges that go across the cut one way or the other. So if we're just talking about the underlying graph, there are three edges that go across the green cut. There they are. Uh, and you see, if you get rid of those edges, the graph will become disconnected. It will just disconnect into two subgraphs, one with vertex set capital S and one with vertex set capital T. And actually, in the definition of a cut, we want those to be those subgraphs to be connected. That's a technical condition, which in all our situations will be sort of automatic. So anyway, we have this green cut and we can associate to any cut something called its capacity. And the capacity of a cut is simply the sum of the capacities of the edges that go from the source side to the sink side of the cut. So we only look at forward, forward edges, forward pointing edges across the cut. So in this case, there are only two of those, actually, because the, the middle one is going backwards. So we only look at the edges, which are going, if you like, from capital S to capital T, when we define the capacity of a cut. And we just add up those capacities. So in this case, that's just 2 plus 8. So the capacity of this particular cut is equal to 2 plus 8, which is 10. Okay. Now it turns out that, in fact, you can't find a cut of this, there aren't many cuts anyway, but you can't find a cut of this network which has a lower capacity than 10. And it's a theorem which I shall uh, try to prove today that the minimum the minimum capacity 
the least capacity of any cut is equal to the value of a maximum flow. Remember, we found that there is the maximum flow. We found a maximum flow of 10 across this network. So 10 is the value of a maximum flow, and it's also the value of a minimum cut. Now, I won't check all the cuts, but I can try and convince you by computing the capacity of the red cut. If you look at the red cut in this example, uh, the capacity of the red cut is much more because for the red cut, we have four edges that disconnect the network going across the cut. And those four edges have capacity, if you add them up, it's 12 plus 4 plus 10, that's 26, plus 8, that's 34. So the capacity of the red cut is actually 34. Um, so, so that's much more. I could also just take the, the cut which goes, running out of colours, let's say the yellow cut that just goes, um, cuts across and just, just makes capital S a singleton set. In that case, the capacity of the yellow cut is 5 plus 12, which is 17. Okay, it's still quite a bit bigger than 10. Okay, so that's the idea of a cut, and that's how you define the capacity of a cut. And as I'll explain now, the capacity of a cut represents the most flow you can get across the cut. If you look at the green cut, you see if we want to maximize the flow going from left to right across the green cut, we want to saturate the forward going edges and make the backward going edge have zero flow. So if we saturate the forward going edges, we get a flow of 10. And that's the capacity of the cut. So the capacity of the cut really is just the most flow you can get across the cut. That's the point. So let me explain that in symbols. Uh, so the point is, if you have a cut, like the green cut we've just been looking at, the net flow across that cut is the value of the flow. OK, so now I'm talking about having a flow in a network before we didn't really need that. But now we have a flow, a valid flow. Remember, a flow means that each flow number has to be less than or equal to the capacity of that pipe. And there's conservation of flow at each vertex other than at the source and the sink. So if we have a flow, we can look at the net flow across the cut. OK, now the net flow means you, you add up all the forward flows going from left to right, the way I'm doing it, and left to right for me, and you subtract the flows going from right to left, in the case of our green cut. Um, and that would be the net flow. And that net flow must be the value of the flow um, because there's conservation of flow. So the flow is generated by the source. We know what the value of the flow is by just adding the flow numbers coming from the source, and you can't lose flow at any other vertex. So if you look at the cut, all the flow coming out from the source must essentially be the same as the net flow across the cut. If there's flow coming backwards, you have to subtract that. But the net flow will be the value of the flow. And if you look at this equation here, we know, of course, that the, the flow numbers by definition, have to be less than the, the corresponding capacities. So the and um, we're on, on the left hand side we're subtracting stuff from that. So uh, the left hand side is clearly less than or equal to what we have if we ignore this term. Uh, even the first term is less than the first summation is already less than or equal to the summation of the capacities. So the whole thing on the left hand side is less than or equal to the sum of the capacities of the forward. We're looking here at the forward edges on the right hand side. So the capacity of the forward edges, that's edges going from capital S to capital T, rather than those going backwards, which is what we have in the second summation. So what that proves is what I, what's fairly obvious that I really said earlier, um, that the capacity of a cut is, represents the maximum flow. Any flow you get across the cut has to be less than or equal to that capacity. 
<clears throat> so that's what I've just said, and that's what the lemma says. The value of any flow is less than or equal to the capacity of any cut. <clears throat> that's what I'm saying, because remember, the capacity of cuts, that's got nothing to do with flows. You work out the capacity of cuts by just looking at the pipes. Uh, so for any flow, this, this little equality here, it works for any flow. So that means the value of any flow on the network, uh, any flow, is less than or equal to the capacity of any cut. That's essentially what I'm proving. Now, the remarkable fact is this theorem here, which goes somewhat further. Uh, this theorem is telling you, so, so we know that the value of any flow, let me remind you, is less than or equal to the capacity of any cut. Okay, the question is, is there something in the middle? Uh, you see, we saw there wasn't with the previous network because we had the capacity of our cut, of our green cut was 10, actually, and the maximum flow was 10. So we have we had equality in that case. And that's always that's always the situation. That the maximum, the value of a maximum flow is, e is always equal to the minimum, the, the least capacity of any cut. So, in fact, the theorem tells us that we can always find a flow and a cut for which the value of the flow is equal to the capacity of the cut. Okay, so in other words, we always we can always get equality uh, in this in this lemma. I mean, this lemma is stating an inequality, uh, but we can always find a flow and a cut for which there's equality. That's what the theorem is saying. Uh, or another way of saying it is that if we if we just want to find the maximum value um, of a flow without worrying about the flow itself, we just have to find the least we have we, we just have to find the least capacity of a cut. So we can start just looking for the cuts rather than the flows. And find one with the least capacity. <clears throat> now that doesn't sound much, but actually, if you if you have quite a complicated network, finding the capacity of a cut is a sort of fun thing to do. It's it's quite easy. You just draw a squiggly 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 line through the network to cut it in two halves, and you just compute the capacity. You just add up all the capacities of the forward arcs from the source side to the sink side. So it's quite easy to compute the capacity of a cut and you can look for one which capacity is least. It's actually much harder to visualize a maximum flow I and mean, typically we use the labeling algorithm to find a maximum flow. If the neighbor, if the network is simple you can find a maximum flow by inspection but it's somehow if you're just using inspection it's much easier to find a minimum cut. So a minimum cut means a cut whose capacity is the least amongst all possible cuts. Uh, so that's why this theorem is called the minimum cut. This theorem is actually called the uh, maximum flow minimum cut theorem. Maximum flow minimum cut. And I want to prove this now um, because the idea of the proof leads to the labeling algorithm which we're going to do next. So the point about what we want to try and do to prove this theorem is we want to try and increase flow, as I sort of explained in the previous video. We want to actually, more precisely, we want to find a path. We're going to start with the source, but we won't necessarily arrive at the sink. We want to find a path along which we can increase the flow. Now, there's one word of warning here. When we're talking about networks and paths in networks, you might think that we have to take all the arrows going in a forward direction. If we're traveling from the source to some vertex, we want all the arrows to move towards that vertex. But that's not what we need here. That would be too restrictive. By a path, we mean a path in the underlying graph. So the, the direction of the edges could be backwards or forwards. So I've used this special symbol here to, to represent that. So I don't actually know. It's not necessarily the case that the part that the arrows go forward. If they do, that would be called an aligned path from one vertex to another. But when we talk about an augmenting path, typically 
not all the arrows will be going forward. In fact, we saw an example of that last time when we were updating our flows. We had a, a, actually an augmenting path in which one arrow was going backwards. Uh, so we're going to use the concept of an augmenting. Augmenting just means increasing. We just want to increase the flow. So it's really a flow, really what the full name would be a flow augmenting or flow increasing path. Okay, so now let me use that notion to prove the theorem in this last slide. So I want to define an augmenting path. So this an augmenting path is given with respect to a flow. So this time we, we can't talk about an augmenting path if we don't have a flow because we want to augment the flow. So we've got to have a flow to augment. So we, we suppose we have a flow. This time I'm going to call it G rather than F. So I want to know when a path, and this path is going to start from the source, and it's going to end up, end up at some vertex, not necessarily the sink. And I want to know when is this augmenting? What's the definition of augmenting? Well, first of all, since I'm starting from the source, this arrow, although I've written it as possibly going both ways, if we, since we're starting from the source, it actually, it ha actually has to go forwards. But the other arrows, I don't know what direction they go. Anyway, this path is augmenting. There are two things you have to check, depending on whether the arrows go forwards or backwards. If they go forwards, you want to be able to push flow along forwards. And in order to do that, you must have spare capacity. So you want, going forwards, you want there to be spare capacity. So you want the existing flow to be less than the capacity of the pipe. Or another way of saying that is that the capacity of the pipe minus the existing flow is positive along that forward edge. Okay, so just start from the from the source, which is here. Uh, of course, the the edge going from the source is always going forwards, and we know if we're going to get fl any flow at all from the source, we need spare capacity. Okay, so we've got to have spare capacity. That's the first condition. Okay, so any time you have a forward, uh, an edge, a directed edge with the arrow going forwards in this path, forwards means from the start of the path towards the end of the path, we want to have spare capacity. On the other hand, we may have one or more backward edges in this path. Maybe this edge here is actually going backwards. Remember our, our pipes are sort of one-way pipes. Or roads are one way roads. So if that edge is going backwards, there's a separate condition we need to satisfy. Uh, we don't care about capacity, because what we want to do is we want to actually reduce the flow. Do you see, to increase the flow from left to right, we want to decrease the flow coming back to U0. You can think of it as leakage. We want to cap off the pipe and stop any leakage. That way we're pushing flow forwards. We're stopping it come backwards. So if we have a backwards arrow, all we need to know is that there is non-zero flow to start with so that we can reduce that flow. Ideally, cut it off completely, but at least reduce it. So what we need for a backward edge is that there is positive flow coming backwards. So we'd want positive flow coming backwards, so in this case U2, from U3. So that's the condition. In this case, it would be U3. In this case, writing the arrow the other way, it would be U3 goes to U2. And we want there to be positive flow from U3. Remember, when I write the flow, I always make sure I write it in the direction of the arrow. So I always write... I always I write G of U3, U2, because if the arrow is going from U3 to U2, I have to write G of U3, U2. And we're assuming that needs to be positive if we can, if we can augment the flow along that edge. Okay, so that's, those are the two conditions we need. And you may have remembered this from the labeling algorithm, because this is, I'm really describing what's going to happen in the labeling algorithm. So there are these two types of edges. In, the, in this sort of setup, in this theory that you'll deal with 
um, with networks, the edges that are sort of going forwards and the edges that are going backwards. And you, you do different things or you, you look at different conditions. So for the backwards edges, we need non-zero flow and we want to reduce that. <clears throat> so the idea is that we can then, given such a path which satisfies these conditions for every edge up to UK, then we can augment the flow by a certain quantity, which is the minimum of these positive numbers, uh, because we will reduce to zero any flow, any backwards flow, and we'll use all the spare capacity we can going forwards. But if, if we only have spare capacity of one on one of the edges, we're doomed on the other edges. We can't do better than one. So we take the minimum, the minimum of these quantities for these k edges. And then we have an augmenting flow provided all the quantities are strictly positive. So going on. Um, now, let me now finish the proof of the theorem. OK, so this, by the way, this uh, notation here, I was just, that's just shorthand for this, um, this augmenting path, which is going from S to the vertex, which is going from S to X. Just uh, squiggles means uh, a lot of edges, which are not necessarily all pointing forward. Uh, so I've just explained that given such an augmenting path, it means we can increase the flow from S to X by the minimum of these quantities. Now, suppose we have a, have a flow now, maximum flow. That means the, the value of the flow is maximum. And define capital S to be the set of all vertices X as above, for which we can construct an augmenting path from the source to x. And capital S will define a cut, actually, we can define t to be the compound. Uh, so by definition, so you see the point is that obviously the source is in capital S, because we're starting from the source, even if we have, the, well, we're always going to have, um, well, we'll always have the source in capital S. Uh, but the sink is not in capital S, because if we could get flow from the source to the sink, the flow wouldn't have been maximum. So uh, the fact that it's a maximum flow means that T cannot be in S. Okay, that implies this. So T is in the complement, because otherwise we could have got an augmenting pass to the sink, but then the flow wouldn't have been maximum. So essentially we do here have a cut. Um, and the point is, what am I trying to show? I'm trying to show that we, uh, I want to show that we have the, the value of the flow is equal to the capacity of the cut. So the point is, consider an edge that goes across the cut. This edge, we don't know what the direction of it is, but it goes across the cut. So because it goes across the cut, it can't satisfy these conditions because otherwise we could have, capital S would have been bigger than we're suggesting. We're taking all vertices for which these two, two conditions are satisfied. So um, this, this edge here, it can't, we can't add it to our path. It, it must fail one of these two conditions. So that will fail one or the other. Um, so well, it depends which which way it's going. So if it's going forwards, it has to it has to fail this condition. If it's going backwards, if the arrow is going backwards, it has to fail that condition. Uh, that means there must be equality in both cases. But that's the same thing as saying that all the forward edges are at capacity, they're saturated, and all the backward edges across the cut have zero flow. And that means that the capacity of the cut is equal to the value of the flow from what I said earlier. So the, uh, well, that's it. So we have a, therefore, we have a flow. Uh, any maximum flow will, I, I've constructed a minimum cut that corresponds to the maximum flow. That's really what I'm saying. And that, that finishes the proof of the theorem. And it tells us a bit more. It actually gives us a way of constructing a minimum cut we do our labeling algorithm, which I described briefly in the past in the previous lecture, 
and we even once we find the maximum flow, we keep going and try and do the, the labeling algorithm with one more iteration. And what happens is we, we don't get to the sink because otherwise we wouldn't have had a maximum flow. But we get a certain set of vertices. We can go up, we can get as far as we can, and using the rules for labeling, which I'll talk about more carefully next time. And once you get stuck, all the labels you've got to will form the, the subset capital S of a minimum cut. And you can check that for the example I started with today. Okay, uh, I'll stop there, but you'll see you'll see lots of examples in the quizzes and exercises sheet.